spill glasses to uh, bounce our spoons over. We just have to have people with loud voices to keep things quiet. But anyway, thank you for coming. Um, I'm breaking a rule today, uh, but since I made the rule, it's okay for me to break it. <laughs> so, I, or shall I say amend it? Yes, I have made a point of not introducing my kin, but for reasons more pragmatic than sentimental, I have decided to do the introduction today. Uh, our speaker has an unusual un intuitive capacity. He chooses an arcane subject and suddenly it becomes incredibly and incredulously relevant. One might say a hot topic. Since I like these intros to be brief, I'll just cite Maury's last year's subject, the duel between Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr. Arcane? Well, check with uh, Lynn Manuel or Miranda about that. His play, Hamilton, was the hottest and most expensive theater ticket on Broadway in decades, if not centuries. So when Maury came up with the idea of secession and nullification, well, the UK pulled out of the European Union, <laughs> and our sanctuary cities and state marijuana laws stood fast in not complying with federal law. I think that's nullification, but we'll know. Not to mention that, in this very week, the Kurds and Catalonians are fighting for their independence. Granted that these are coincidences, but when I count the number of books that Maury has read in the past six months on secession and nullification, I can only say he will know what he's talking about, <laughs> and we'll know that it's relevant. Welcome to the podium. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. I, I think this is the 13th lecture I've given at Shamo, and I broke through. She introduced me in the first time. So, so I want to say this about the presenters at Shamo. We've had Pulitzer Prize winners. We've had le leading academicians. We've had public intellectuals. We've had prominent journalists. And then we've had me. <laughs> now, I am distinctive. I am separate from all the others. I am the only person who stands before you to present and chat with you a program that has to pay for my lunch. <laughs> So, two words, nullification and secession. Well, first, let me define them as I think uh, I understand nullification. We're talking in a political context about sovereigns and where we have a super authority, a central authority, and a lesser authority or a group within it decides that it wants to separate from that authority, wants to leave, but remain within the same place. So those are the two components of secession. Leave, but stay. <laughs> Different from revolution. Revolution, you seek to overthrow the sovereign. Yes, you're remaining, but you want a change in that government. And so you say, wait a minute, the American Revolution, was that a revolution? Or was it a secession? Well, here's this half-baked amateur historian who has to pay for his own lunch here, <laughs> telling you that the revolution is a misnomer. It was not a revolution, it was a secession. In, in that the colonists for the, in the first instance, wanted to remain. They wanted in. And when the British foolishly didn't permit that, they said, all right, we'll leave. But we won't overthrow the king. We won't uh, affect the House of Commons or the House of Lords. We will carry on. And as a matter of fact, within a short time after they left, John Adams, 
was designated as the minister of the Court of St. James to establish relationships with that country. It's also not a migration where mass numbers of people leave because they don't fit the first test, that of remaining in the territory. So how did this all begin, secession? Well, it's credited with, uh, by the way, before we get to that, nullification, what is it? Well, nullification is kind of a cousin of secession, but not as extreme. What it says is that we remain within the structure of government. However, we choose to reject certain legislative acts or acts of executives and we nullify them. For our purposes, this uh, subordinate authority says, we don't go along with you. Uh, where do we have nullification? Well, let's take a look, and we will a sh short time later, on marijuana and federal laws and states operating entirely independent of it or sanctuary cities, the same thing. Now, <clears throat> secession, as Sandra pointed out, I think we can eliminate the question mark, is it about to erupt? Because within the last 10 days, two active secessionist movements in the world, the Kurds in Iraq and the Catalans in Spain. And we're now dealing with a third one that we're all more familiar with, Brexit. So it started in terms of expression of defiance in 1688, the Glorious Revolution. King James II was replaced by whom? By his daughter Mary and her husband William. They threw them out. It was a religious conflict. James was a staunch Catholic, and his daughter was a more fervent Protestant. Now, it doesn't exactly meet the test of secession or nullification, but nevertheless, that's described as the origin of this kind of expression of defiance of a central authority. In this country, it probably began in 1763, when the French and Indian War ended, known also as the Seven Year War, and the British were successful in their military efforts against the French. The Parliament in England said, wait a minute, here's a military expenditure, and England was in financial difficulty, that was successful for whom? For the colonists. And there's a whole vast country that who knows how successful it's gonna be, but it has enormous potential far beyond what we do in the United Kingdom. Shouldn't they pay for it? Not an unreasonable request. So they enacted the Stamp Tax Act in 1765. And that act said that you require a stamp on virtually everything, on all legal documents, wills, trusts, contracts, on peer periodicals, newspapers, journals, magazines, on more popular items, playing cards and dice. And the colonists said no. They said, if you would enact some imposition across our, the entire empire, that would be okay. But when you impose it just on us, we re resist. The pressures became so strong that the merchants in London, who had a uh, substantial interest in, of course, selling goods to the colonists, went to Parliament and said, pull it back, and the Stamp Act was repealed. But it gave the first instance of defiance in terms of our colonies to uh, the British. 
A decade later, we were at war. Lexington and Concord had taken place, Bunker Hill had taken place. Uh, um, the king had repudiated any responsibility as sovereign for the colonists of any kind of protection or security. And they, they formed a, what was called a Continental Congress, Congress of the 13 colonies, which said that it was important to have a defiance in a way that did accomplish our separation from the colonies, from the, from the crown. So they, in June of 1776, Richard Henry Lee, one of the famous Lees of Virginia, rose at this Continental Congress, which had no semblance of structure. How it was put together was uh, just uh, in the whim of the colonies, and said that there should be and, ought, and we ought to immediately separate from the king. Now, Lee was under considerable pressure from Virginia, which was looking for secession, but there was more active interest from Massachusetts, where the Adams boys, Samuel and John, were leading the struggle there. And so the Continental Congress, this body that was ill-formed, said, all right, let's <coughs> Be not be so hasty, let's appoint a committee, and that committee will report back to us in three weeks on what should be done. The committee, Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, Roger Sherman, Robert Livingston. Well, who should head that committee? Who should do the draftsmanship on what was going to be a document that was gonna come back to this Congress? Benjamin Franklin was the obvious choice. He was too old and too sick, and he didn't like committees anyway. <laughs> so, so John Adams goes to Thomas Jefferson, and this has been documented in the diary of both Adams and Jefferson, and says to Jefferson, you should prepare the document for three reasons. One, you can write 10 times better than I can, Two, you're not as obnoxious as I am. <laughs> and three, you're a Virginian. And that reflected the whole kind of political struggle that it was believed that the auspices of this whole effort was being done by the North and particularly Massachusetts. So Jefferson prepared a document. It was somewhat reviewed by Adams and uh, Franklin. And he brought it before on June 28th of 1776 before the Continental Congress. The document is called the Declaration of Independence. And um, the independence, incidentally, was approved on July 2nd. And that's the date that John Adams wrote Abigail and said it will be remembered in history, the day when we'll celebrate, we'll have parades, fireworks, and somehow it got moved to July 4th. <laughs> but believe me, uh, between John Adams and Abigail, I'd more rely on them than I would on future historians. So, uh, so the, the Declaration of Independence has several parts to it. The critical part at that time, now irrelevant, was a charge against King George, 27 counts against him. Uh, they were of some particularity, and some were fanciful, but uh, there they were, they had some specificity to them. So the other part that said, we, um, we recognize the importance of the freedom of people, and so he said, we have give life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, uh, and that priority, life and liberty, that contradicts what Patrick Henry said, who said, give me liberty or give me death. He would have reversed it and said, liberty, life, 
and the pursuit of happiness. And he also note that it said, the pursuit of happiness, not happiness, but the pursuit of it. And why didn't that Jefferson say, life, liberty, and property, which was a more popular and more likely phrase to use, because property was considered slaves, and he didn't want to establish any appropriateness for the right to slavery, even though at the time he held 200 slaves. So the Declaration of Independence then said that as a result of this, there are governments that are formed. And those governments that are formed are for carrying out that purpose of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But if they fail, then there should be the prospect, the, poss the availability of alteration or change. That also meant revolution or secession. So from there, they moved to now what do they do? Now they got a Declaration of Independence, they're independent, uh, they, they're in a war, the war goes on for uh, five, five years, but it appears that they're likely to prevail, and they're operating under this government, and so they undertake to draft a constitution. It took them four and a half years, and the constitution was called the Articles of Confederation. It had two aspects to it relevant to what we're talking about. That is, it said it was a perpetual union and in order for any significant action to be taking place, it must be unanimous. <coughs> well, they saw after a few years that the Articles of Confederation were not successful. They had some virtues, some significant virtues to it to it and some, some uh, features that we still uh, use, but it didn't have any central authority, it didn't have any central judiciary, it didn't have the capacity to tax, it had to deal with the uh, whim of the uh, states. So two men, you'll know their names, Alexander Hamilton and James Madison said, we have to do something about this. And what do we have to do? We need a new document. And so they undertook to call a Continental Congress. And they said that the charge was solely to revise the Articles of Confederation. Now, when they went there, they didn't solely revise the Articles of Confederation, they threw them all out. <laughs> and they didn't recognize that the Articles of Confederation said you had a perpetual union and they further didn't recognize that it required unanimous consent for anything. They said, our new constitution, our constitution that we now uh, live by, would go into effect when nine states approved. So when New Hampshire became state number nine, what did we do? We seceded. We seceded from our government that existed at the time and came into operation a new, uh, a new, a new government. Uh, we moved along and um, ad adopted a constitution, which incidentally says nothing about secession. There's no sec secession referenced in it. George Washington's elected president. And in 1791, Alexander Hamilton says, our country needs to do some taxing. We've got some very susceptible tax payers. Who? The whiskey farmers out in western Pennsylvania. We're going to tax them. Whiskey farmers said, oh no, the tax wasn't significant, but it was, the issue <coughs> was. We're going to tax them. And the farmer said, we're going to revolt. We may secede. We certainly will nullify. We're going to do something. The first really significant action by uh, American citizens 
against the country. Washington said, okay, he got on his horse and led 13,000 troops out through western Pennsylvania and backed them down. But it didn't stop there. In 1798, John Adams is president of the United States. And we're th relations with France are very tense. Look very likely that we would go to war. Adams has enacted four acts called the Alien and Sedition Acts. Now the Alien Act said, among other things, you had to move the citizenship requirement from five years to 14 years, but also the Alien Enemies Act said that the president could deport or intern any citizen who originated from a hostile country. Any American citizen could be interned. It formed the basis for FDR to intern 120,000 Japanese in 1942. Um, the Sedition Act, by the way, that act still is in effect in some modified forms. Uh, the Sedition Act said that you cannot malign, accuse, uh, abuse, uh, you can't say unworthy or scandalous things about the president or the government or the members of Congress. Noticeably absent from that law was the vice president, <laughs> who happened to be Thomas Jefferson. So what, what happened? that two of our most revered revolutionary period, you'll excuse me for using that term, our secessionary period, uh, Jefferson and James Madison went to work. Madison wrote what was called the Virginia Resolves, in which he said, not so much you can nullify, but he said you can interpose and that means you can express yourself in defiance of um, national enactment, and you can recruit people to other, other states to support you on it. Jefferson went much further in what he wrote, the Kentucky Resolves. Now, he's the Vice President of the United States, and he said you can nullify an act which is inappropriate to your jurisdiction. You can nullify a federal act that is uh, uh, an antithesis to your uh, particular state, probably an act of treason for the Vice President of the United States to say you can uh, reject, repudiate a uh, act. Eight, in the early 1800s, the secession movement in this country was led by the North, particularly New England. They didn't like the Louisiana Purchase. They didn't like the Embargo Act of 1808. They didn't like the War of 1812. And in fact, the New England states in 1814 went to Hartford to a convention to discuss secession. They got sidetracked on other issues, but went down to Washington, some of their representatives, and by that time the war was over. 1820, Missouri seeks to come into the United States. Missouri met all of the qualifications, population, uh, financial stability, whatever it was at the time. One problem, there were 22 states, 11 slave, 11 free. Missouri would tip the scale, most probably slave states, and affect the United States Senate. So there's Maine up in, which is part of Massachusetts, that Massachusetts wasn't particularly enthused about anyway having it. Uh, they <laughs> saw them as more French Canadians and uh, New Englanders, and permitted Massachusetts to secede from Massachusetts and become a state on its own, and that put the balance at now 12 and 12. 
that was led, that compromise, by Henry Clay, who was considered the great compromiser. There are two other instances where states seceded um, from, from uh, the particular state and formed their own state. 1824, John Quincy Adams is running for president and he's running against Andrew Jackson. Nobody gets an electoral majority, which the Constitution says has to be uh, now determined by the House of Representatives, which each state, each state has one vote. There are representatives from each state. So if you're Delaware and you have one state, one vote, uh, one congressman, you have one vote. And if you're Virginia and you have 20, you still have one vote. Uh, Henry Clay, who ran against uh, Quincy Adams, went to him apparently and said, hey, you make me Secretary of State and I'll deliver the House of Representatives to you. Well, I don't know what happened except Henry Clay became the Secretary of State. Um, running with John Quincy Adams was John C. Calhoun from South Carolina. Um, and he was then a confirmed states' rights man. Um, in 1828, they imposed a tariff, and the South, and particularly South Carolina, said that's an abominable tariff. That's what was known as the abominable tariff. And Calhoun, as vice president, led the charge to challenge it. John Quincy Adams is running again for president, and who's he running against? Andrew Jackson, the man he defeated before. And his vice president, John C. Calhoun, jumps ship and teams up with Andrew Jackson as his vice president. Um, now they defeat Quincy Adams, and in 1832 there's another tariff, and South Carolina says, we're going to secede. Henry Clay, the great compromiser, comes back in the role and says, well, let's see what we can do. And Andrew Jackson, they, the expectations were that Andrew Jackson would be quite uh, aligned with Calhoun. They were both born in South Carolina. They were both Southerners. They were, uh, his interest was well known, but he was also a nationalist. And he said, when South Carolina threatened secession, he said, when I find, if there's any blood spilled, and I find the person who was, any person who was responsible for that, I'll hang that person from the first tree I can find. So now South Carolina's on a course of secession, and Henry Clay called back in, a compromise on the tariff, of the next year, 1833, and South Carolina withdraws its secession movement. However, the federal government enacted what was called the force bill, which said, we can force you to adhere to our national law. South Carolina said, we will nullify that. <laughs> and that nullification still exists. The force law was never enforced, and the nullification still exists. Now, what's interesting at this point is these secession movements were not based on slavery. They were based on economic movement, particularly tariffs. So it, um, in 18, the 1840s, the secession movement was fairly active, and it was led again by the North. William Lloyd Garrison said, this Constitution is a covenant made by the devil an agreement made in hell. Let's get rid of the South. Um, 1850, California seeks to come into the Union. And at this point, they're not so much concerned about balance of who's, what slave states, what's free states. And Texas, which had seceded from Mexico, uh, was given some 
sizable amount um, in um, what was called the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850. There had been a Fugitive Slave Law in 1793, but this one was much more severe. In that, it provided that any person who made claim that a slave that ran away was the property of that claimant, you went before a commissioner. Commissioners are appointed by the federal government, the federal judges, and here's the absurdity. The person who was deemed to be a slave could not testify or put any proof in on challenging that. Furthermore, the commissioners were paid $10 if they determined that the slave was the property, in fact, of that claimant, and $5 if he found otherwise. So, <clears throat> now, that fugitive slave law was challenged by Wisconsin, so we nullify it. Went up to the Wisconsin Supreme Court, said, you're right, it's nullified. Went to the Supreme Court and they said, no, you can't do that, you can't do that. So we come to 1860, we have a presidential election. Abraham Lincoln receives 39% of the vote. There were three other candidates, including Stephen Douglas, John Breckinridge, the Vice President of the United States, and another man, John Bell. On the, within one week after Lincoln is elected, South Carolina says we're calling a conference, uh, convention to secede. And what do they rely on? They rely on the Declaration of Independence. Now, I don't know why historians don't challenge that comparison because the Declaration of Independence, when Jefferson wrote it, he had 27 counts against King George. When South Carolina declared we're going to secede, all they had was a man who was elected president. They had no counts. He wasn't going to take office until uh, March, and, but they proceeded. And as you know, by February, seven states uh, had uh, seceded. Incidentally, back in 1850, John C. Calhoun, leader of the nullification movement in this country, forecast as he was dying that this country will dissolve and it will, there will be a presidential election all occurring within the next 12 years. He was off only by one year. Oh. All right, so that's enough of that history. Let's jump forward to secession and nullification today. Uh, <clears throat> secession, Soviet Union, fragmented. However, Soviet Union's constitution permitted secession. Incidentally, back on the Civil War, when 49 counties in Western Virginia said we don't agree with the secession, we choose to, those counties seceded and formed what was called West Virginia. Now, it's ironic that we're fighting a secession movement by 11 states, and we're recognizing West Virginia with no authority whatsoever from, from, from the state of Virginia to secede and permitting secession. That was state number two, uh, 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 in addition to Maine. Three was Kentucky that seceded from Virginia in earlier days uh, with, no, with no problems. So the Soviet Union <clears throat> seceded. Yugoslavia, now six different countries, and even fragmented more with Kosovo uh, challenging in Ser Serbia, um, seceded. In 1995, Canada faced this problem. Quebec said, it's been established we are a distinct society. Therefore, we're going to secede. We'll take, put it to vote. 
within a hairline it came of accomplishing it. But it, did, it wasn't a majority. In 1998, Canadians got very much concerned about this. They said, well, we, we, we have this problem. Let's put it to the Supreme Court of Canada as to whether they can take place. The Supreme Court came out with a bizarre decision. It said, no, provinces, you can't secede. However, where there is a clear majority vote on a clear issue, then the federal government must negotiate in good faith with the uh, province that is seeking secession. No one has any idea what that means. They don't have any idea what a clear majority is. Is that one vote or is it? Uh, uh, and dealing in good faith, all right, you deal in good faith and nothing happens. What do you do then? So Canada's in that uh, quandary. Of course, Scotland came within a hairline also of uh, seceding and now is in a peculiar position of having Scotland having said, Oh, we want to remain in the uh, in the European Union, and if we pull out, we want to go back into the European Union. So uh, that's uh, now. How about in this country? Well, last year's election had a huge impact on a segment of the American people reacting to it. Uh, Oregon, there was quite a uh, frenzy. There has been, have been secessionist movements in this country for some time. Texas is always talking about secession. It's believed, uh, a Zogby poll of a few years ago said maybe as many as 25% of the people in this country believe in permitting it, although they are a little more skeptical about whether we should be part of that secession. California, after the uh, election, has now presented to the Attorney General of California the California Autonomy from Federal Government Initiative, which recently the California Attorney General certified as a legitimate issue to be placed on the uh, election in 2018 provided they get 585,000 votes to seek that. Uh, I think that's uh, an outcome that is unlikely. But, but by the way, uh, you, people would react and say, well, that's a whole liberal movement. Can you imagine how gleeful the conservatives, how gleeful the Republican Party would be if California seceded from the country? Hillary Clinton won this election last uh, in the popular vote by 2.8 million votes. She carried California by almost 4.3. Without California, Donald Trump won the popular vote. Furthermore, uh, those who would be in, enthused about California seceding would say, hey, wow, we get two liberal senators out of there and there are 39 Congress folks from California that would give a greater majority. So I'm just saying that, uh, although it's uh, not at all likely to happen, uh, but there are forces at two extremes that both would be enthused with California seceding. The California Constitution says that we are inseparable from the, the United States government. So that's on the docket for California voters to consider. And it does provide that either there will be a greater role of autonomy by California or they will leave the country. Um, nullification. In 1970, the federal government enacted the Controlled Substances Act. Federal crime to grow 
dispense or use given narcotics. Schedule one, the most severe one, on it appears marijuana. There are 29 states in this country and the District of Columbia that permit the use of medical marijuana. And if you think that's uh, questionable, there are eight states in the District of Columbia that permit recreational use of marijuana. Now, how do you explain that? How do you have a federal statute that says it's a crime to do this and over 60% of the population of this country, including Pennsylvania now, say we will permit marijuana under given circumstances? I think that's nullification. I think, uh, uh, I think sanctuary cities where the federal government says we want information relating to undocumented uh, residents and cities say go to hell. I, I, I think that is in effect challenging uh, the federal government. So we come back and we say is it dead or about to erupt? Hey, it's erupted. Uh, I don't think we'll have any, there's any prospect of having any secession of states in this country. I do think that nullification is alive. I think throughout the rest of the world, you are going to have it. You have the Kurds and you have the uh, uh, Catalans uh, just this week uh, showing their anx anxieties for independence. So has it erupted? Yeah, it's erupted. Thank you. Yes, Richard. Donald Trump has compared himself favorably to Andrew Johnson. Andrew Jackson. Yeah. Couldn't he more favorably be compared to Andrew Johnson? You're reflecting your view and my view, Richard. <laughs> there may be others, sure. Uh, uh, a Andrew Jackson, as I said, was a strong nationalist. Uh, and Andrew Johnson obviously was a fluke as, as president. So I think the comparison might be more appropriate, but I don't know the, how helpful that is to where we are on this subject. Yeah, yeah, uh, Kevin. Yeah. Kevin. Yeah. Kim. When you spoke about nullification, the example you used about uh, immigrants, uh, where local governments say we're not giving you the information that you requested to the federal government. Uh, let me describe a somewhat different situation. One is that it's a federal law that has to do with immigration, but local officials, I believe, are not required to enforce federal law. Uh, and, and, and I believe that's a, a principle of American law. So they're not really nullifying it. They're just saying you can't preempt us and you can't co-opt us and make, make us enforce immigration law if we are the police department in Scranton or the police department in Los Angeles. Yeah, I think you're correct to, to a, a point on that. I think that um, there is, for example, when local sheriffs were called upon to enforce uh, crimes, they're saying, well, we have no responsibility to do that. So it's kind of what I would call a constructive nullification. And let me say this, that we have another kind of nullification in this country that we probably don't even think about, and that's jury nullification. Jury nullification, we, as we know in our system, the responsibility of a, in a trial of a case is for the judge to instruct the jury on the law appropriate to the case and the jury to apply the facts. The jury does not have any discretion in terms of um, determining the law. Now we know that in many instances, jurors come to decisions separate from the facts because they believe that the law is such that is undesirable. So we have kind of actions that are not uh, particularly prohibited, 
but in fact are in practice because uh, the body that's uh, responsible for that decision is uh, making a decision that says uh, we don't want to uh, respect, in this instance, cent central authority. Yeah, yeah, Steve. Basically, they're running a business. And what a business is one, they want the state to protect them. They want what? They want the state to protect them. They want to be sure when they put money in the bank it isn't going to disappear if they're having a problem with that. They want to make sure they can't have things stolen, et cetera, et cetera. They're quite different from a white nationalist who in some ways resembles the Kurds or the bots who really think that they ought to have a separate state based upon certain kinds, as they see it, cultural arrangements and so on, which put them away from and free from the state. So are these really the same things? I think so. Yes, I think, look, when you have a national legislation that says it's a crime to grow, dispense or use p marijuana, and you have states that say we permit it under given circumstances, that is, in my opinion, clearly nullification. And the problem comes when you talk about enforcement, you talk about, yes, banks are nervous because they're saying, um, they're saying, uh, we make a loan? Is it an illegal loan? How about lawyers? who sit there and give advice to uh, clients who are starting a marijuana operation, are they committing a crime? Are the lawyers committing a crime actively then? So it's a very serious thing. But I think, I think clearly um, permitting the marijuana is a nullification. Now, how does the federal government under the Obama administration deal with this? I mean, I think that uh, Sessions is probably going to deal with it in a different way. Um, what they said was the problem of enforcement of this is so demanding that we're going to say we limit the kinds of conduct that we prohibit. This is by letter in 2013 from Deputy Attorney General uh, to his staff announcing what should be done. You don't sell the children. You don't sell for to organized crime. You don't sell for use it for money laundering. You don't use, uh, use it for permitting in states that recognize it to go across state lines. They had all kinds of several things. Basically, they were saying it's a pain for us to enforce this. Uh, and uh, of course, the medical marijuana had considerable appeal in terms of it. The recreational marijuana is somewhat uh, lesser appealing, obviously, but uh, but I do think it's nullification. Yeah. Yeah, Paula. How can the president uh, nullify NATO and nullify all the other things he's doing? Uh, NATO and now with. Paris Agreement and all these other things he's trying to nullify that Obama did. How, how is he going to get away with this? Well, those who are, would be critical of your question would ask, how did Obama get away with permitting it? Permitting it? So if it's presidential action, it's, it's permitted. What, what Sandra might want to get for her next uh, Schemmel Forum is a question on president versus Congress and who's got what what authority, that's a whole different kind of thing. But whatever, Obama, uh, whatever Trump is doing, he's doing within the framework of pres presidential authority. Yeah, yeah, yeah. David. Maury, uh, just sort of musing on why the Constitution does not include uh, a mechanism for secession. 
uh, it, we could call it something other than that. We could call it for why a state cannot, under some circumstances, remove itself from the union. I mean, if they could have set a high bar or something approaching what a constitutional amendment would require. But it seems like that kind of um, relief valve would be something better than, and short of having to go to war with the state if it took that action. Do you know if that was ever debated in the, in the Constitution oh, yeah. uh, by the framers? I'd say this, answer you this way, David. If I were hired by a state to argue the case for secession, here's what I would say. I would say, number one, the Declaration of Inde Independence. Uh, uh, number two, uh, the Articles of Confederation. First, uh, number two, I'd say, we in fact seceded. By the way, here we are, we secede, we give the world the concept of secession, and then 80 years later, we give the world the concept of why you can't secede. Uh, same country. So I, I would uh, say that. I would say that the Articles of Confederation, that was a secession. We had no problem with that. I'd say that when we came to the Constitutional Convention, you had smart men like Hamilton and Madison. They didn't put anything about secession in the document. It doesn't exist. Um, I would say that it was OK to talk about secession when the North was talking about it, uh, primarily for uh, other reasons. And perhaps most important, I would say, there's this amendment called the Tenth Amendment. The Tenth Amendment says the powers not delegated to the government nor prohibited to the states are reserved to the states. So I'd say anything that isn't in that Constitution is permitted to the states. And finally, I'd say, how did we come about? We came about by secession, uh, so it shouldn't be so bad. That's if I were hired to argue for a state. <laughs> I'd lose. Uh, yeah, Ro? Um, I'm thinking laterally. We encourage California to become South California, Mid California, North Car California, South Oregon, North Oregon, and Washington. So we get a few more senators. <laughs> Ro, knowing you as the supreme activist that you are, I give you that challenge. <laughs> children. Right. 
sometimes what I hear are those generation of religious activists who are actively doing that. And I'm not entirely sure how that interfaces with the conversations that happen politically in this country, if that makes sense. Um, because the conversations I was part of and listened to really started an ethical and religious ob objection to the way our country was supporting unjust regimes in Central America that were killing their own people. Yeah. <coughs> the contributions are uh, abundant, and hypocrisy in political life is, is a way of life. Look, you take Take Catalonia today. Um, the Catalonia, which probably would be self-sufficient, it, it, it's a kind of a strong engine, economic engine, and would want to be in the United uh, European Union. Now, here's the European Union, talk about contradictions, that talks about human rights and obviously in this election there were abuses that were excessive uh, as a key feature of it. At the same time saying it's the sanctity of borders are important to us. We don't want to see this kind of disruptive thing. So and in addition to which Spain is a member of the European Union so they're, one of their colleagues is there. So how do they deal with, with that? How do they reconcile human rights violations with uh, an effort that is trying to disrupt that sanctity of those those borders. So the contradictions are abundant in where, where, whatever you're talking about. Yeah. 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 She, she, she's now going to tell me what I'm going to have for dinner tonight. <laughs> I think I'll invite him out for dinner. <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, thank you. Uh, we'll see you at the next uh, Chamon event, whether it's a course or a, uh, a, a luncheon. And I thank the speaker very much for giving us some knowledge.